Good afternoon and welcome to our oncology lecture series. I am Dr. Gawad Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you'll have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located on the bottom of your screen. I will be the moderator for today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Robert Press. His presentation is titled, Clinical Update in Proton Therapy. Dr. Press is a board-certified radiation oncologist at Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute, specializing in treating cancer in the center nervous system, tumors, and uh, thoracic malignancies. Dr. Press received his medical degree at uh, Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. He completed his radiation oncology residency at the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory University, where he also served as a chief resident. During his residency, he was named the Andrew W. Uh, Pipus resident in radiation oncology, an honor selected uh, by the faculty for residents who exemplifies professional and compassionate patient care. Before joining Baptist Health in 2023, Dr. Press was a radiation oncologist at New York Proton Center, serving as the disease site lead for both central nervous system tumors and head and neck cancers. During his time, he also served as assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai Hospital and as, an, as a visiting investigator for the Department of Radiation Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Dr. Press has extensive experience using proton therapy and other advanced radiation techniques to treat challenging tumors, including retreatment of patients who previously received radiation therapy. He has developed numerous clinical trials and has been published in more than 60 scientific papers, participated in multiple clinical um, conferences uh, locally and abroad. Dr. Press is a member of several professional societies, including the American College of Radiation Oncology, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the American College of Radiology. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Press. Dr. Press, thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Please go ahead and share your screen. Great. Thank you, Dr. Keen. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the um, opportunity uh, to speak here today. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. So, let's see. All right. You should be able to see my screen now. It's coming. Yep. Okay. Excellent. All right. So, um, as Dr. Kim said, I'm Bob Press, radiation oncologist at uh, Miami Cancer Institute, and I'm excited to speak to you guys about uh, some clinical updates in the world of proton therapy. It's certainly an exciting time in the world of radiotherapy with uh, numerous advanced uh, forms of radiation uh, modalities that are available, um, and I'd like to dive into uh, proton therapy specifically today. So I have no disclosures. So a uh, quick overview, uh, we'll, we'll discuss proton therapy. First, I uh, want to understand the differences between uh, proton therapy and conventional X-ray or photon energy uh, therapy. We also want to uh, discuss uh, the benefits and limitations of this modality, and then we'll dive into some of the latest clinical data in support of proton therapy uh, and discuss some ongoing clinical trials. So here at the Miami Cancer Institute, we're very fortunate to have one of the widest range of radiation technologies that you can find at any cancer center. Um, this is the, our uh, arsenal here of different uh, radiation modalities. Um, you know, this uh, allows us to really personalize you know, our treatment recommendations for patients and really employ the optimal uh, modality for any given diagnosis. And most of these uh, machines listed here are um, uh, deliver X-ray or photon radiation. Um, and um, I'd say the, maybe the most unique uh, uh, modality is our proton therapy center, uh, which is what I'll be focusing on today. So sorry to show you a uh, high school physics textbook figure here, but just wanted to clear the air on the difference between proton and photon therapy. So most uh, commonly, at radiation therapy is delivered using X-rays, which is uh, on the electromagnetic spectrum. And the goal of any ionizing radiation therapy in cancer care is to damage the DNA of the tumor cell and cause the tumor to die. 
Um, and that's most commonly done with x-rays. Now, proton therapy is literally the proton particle of the atom um, that is uh, isolated and uh, accelerated and used uh, clinically uh, to deliver a beam of protons and, and to do the um, and to damage the DNA of the tumor cell as well. So this is the, the physical difference between the two modalities. Now, proton therapy is, is not necessarily a new modality, uh, but it's certainly a newly proliferating modality. Uh, you can see here there are 42 operational proton centers uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, and uh, the earliest uh, operational center was uh, established at Loma Linda in 1990. Um, so there we've you know, now had um, you know, 40 years of proton, uh, uh, clinical proton experience. Um, but as you can see, the vast majority of these um, were established in the last five to eight years, uh, including our center here at Miami Cancer Institute, which uh, was, uh, began operations in 2017. And uh, the reason, part of the reason for uh, you know, limited uh, clinical experience you know, relative to conventional X-ray radiation is that these proton centers are you know, um, expensive. There is tremendous infrastructure that is required in order to, um, to achieve what we're trying to achieve. And this is just a schematic of, um, you know, of the center here. Um, as you can see, there is a giant cyclotron in the top right, uh, which is used to accelerate the proton particle to the nearest speed of light. It is then guided along a beam path, uh, beam line using magnets, and then directed individually into each treatment room. Uh, and it's actually directed in different directions by the giant gantry on the bottom right, which is about uh, 10 meters uh, in height uh, and rotates um, you know, in uh, 360 degrees. Um, and so this is what is required to um, clinically uh, utilize proton therapy for patients. And then ultimately, this is what uh, the patient sees on the uh, other end of the gantry laying on the treatment table. Uh, just a little more nuance between photon and proton therapy. So, you know, x-ray radiation uh, is uh, the tried and true modality. And as x-rays, just like when you go and get a CT scan or chest x-ray, enters the body and then goes through to the other side, there's an exit dose and it fully penetrates the patient. Um, this is in uh, uh, opposition to proton therapy, which given the particle that it is and the physical properties, goes to a certain uh, de depth in tissue, but then stops and releases all its energy. So you can see that in the schematic um, on the bottom of the screen. And then the depth dose curves um, on the right showing that protons in that orange color stop um, at a certain um, distance, whereas the x-rays continue through. And this is a phenomenon called the Bragg peak where the dose will just stop. As you can imagine, this um, unnecessary radiation beyond the tumor, um, you know, might have uh, you know increased risk for certain side effects, and um, that is really the potential gain here when we use proton therapy. Uh, one more schematic here: as you can see um, as the dose, uh, as the beam goes along a depth on the x-axis here, uh, the proton energy will slowly deteriorate, um, but it doesn't release the majority of its energy until it reaches a certain energy threshold. And that's where all these ionizing events in the blue dots um, occur. And so the vast majority of the energy is released in this Bragg peak um, towards the end of the proton range. And how do we uh, apply this clinically? And so um, we are able to steer the protons using the positive charge um, and using magnets um, to uh, scan across the tumor, starting with the furthest uh, point of the tumor, um, and then uh, degrading the energy as we go along here to treat a more shallow depth. And this is how we're able to deliver the radiation particle beam um, accurately um, to the tumor. Now, I do want to quickly mention that not all proton therapies uh, is, are the, is the same. There's older generations. We are in our third generation of proton therapy using spot scanning or pencil beam scanning proton therapy, as I had just described. As you can see um, in this uh, figure on the top, there's actually an older generation as well using a scattering technique where the um, particle uh, beam uh, is uh, scattered and then um, uh, you know, curved or um, you know, modulated using an aperture and a compensator. But really what this means clinically is that it's not as um, precise when it comes to the dose delivery, and we're not able to spare the dose um, proximal to the target as well. And so this is, um, as you'll see in, in um, a couple of studies I'll discuss, uh, relevant for you know, clinical outcomes. Uh, and the third generation, the latest generation proton therapy, um, you know, is the most precise and conformal is what we have here 
at Miami Cancer Institute. So what, how does this translate to the patient? So this is uh, a schematic of the dose profile of a patient with lung cancer, um, comparing the proton plan on the left and the photon plan on the right. And as you can see, we're able to treat a very complex, very large target, you know, much more precisely with proton therapy uh, than we are with the photon radiation, which has that exit dose. So in um, certain patients like this, you can see you know, on, on, on the image here, a pretty dramatic difference in the radiation exposure. And you can imagine the potential side effects that the patient might experience during treatment. And so when we think about who can we treat with proton therapy, I, I will often get asked, can Dr. Press, can you treat this patient with proton therapy? And the answer is technically, yes, we can treat pretty much anyone with proton therapy. And the real question that the, you know, the, the big question is, you know, will this patient uh, gain you know, clinical value or a clinical benefit from using proton therapy? And for that, it does get a little more nuanced. So I would say that proton therapy is certainly appropriate for a subset of patients. And of course, with any a limited resource, we have to be a little more selective. Um, and so when we think about who, you know, would most benefit from using this modality, we think about different factors such as what disease site we're treating, the age or the prognosis of the patient, how close is the tumor to vital organs or normal tissues that we're trying to spare? And then has the patient received prior radiation therapy, which uh, as you can imagine is a, is a more uh, risky or um, challenging scenario to treat uh, again um, with second course radiation. And so it really comes down to these types of factors. It depends on the goal of the treatment. Are we trying to minimize toxicity? Or are we trying to uh, get more radiation dose into the tumor um, to improve tumor control. And that's um, the case in some select uh, instances, which I'll talk about. So that's the kind of big picture of uh, proton therapy. Um, now I'd like to discuss some, uh, some of the data to support it. So I'm going to go through a select number of disease sites and clinical scenarios here, starting with brain and spine tumors. So this is an area that's near and dear to my heart and one of my uh, specializations. Um, the classic Disease, uh, disease entity for proton, for, for proton therapy is a chordoma or chondrosarcoma. And so these are tumors that actually arise from the bone um, along the clivus, for example, or along the uh, mobile spine or the sacrum. And these are classically very challenging tumors to treat. Uh, they're often very rate resistant. They're often located near very critical structures, so making it hard to fully resect. And we know that uh, with conventional photon radiation or IMRT, we often have to undertreat the tumor in order to meet our normal tissue dose constraints in order not to harm a patient. And so when we do that, we often increase the risk of a tumor recurrence. And this is an example of using proton therapy in this instance where we have a, 30, a young 37-year-old who had a clival chordoma that um, extended into the epidural space and was able to be resected to some degree but still needed adjuvant radiation therapy. And using proton therapy, we're able to modulate the dose and carve the dose much more accurately and precisely along critical structures, for example, like the brain stem and then in the normal um, the normal brain parenchyma, and deliver a very high dose of radiation that would otherwise been more much more challenging or not feasible at all. And so, you know, what does this mean for patient outcomes in this disease site? So as we can see here, dose matters. Uh, this is a dose response curve. As the on, on the left, and as the dose uh, increases, as the dose we're able to deliver to the tumor increases, you can see the chance of controlling the tumor at five years, you know, dramatically increases exponentially here, um, to the point where you know we, in meta analyses, looking at a large number of patients, we're able to uh, identify an improvement in overall survival for patients who receive this type of therapy because we're able to deliver more radiation dose to this radio resistant tumor. So this has been kind of the poster child for proton therapy for some time. And now we're trying to explore other disease sites where there could be a potential benefit. And kind of going away from tumor control and thinking more about deterring, uh, uh, de uh, reducing the risk or mitigating the risk of uh, toxicity, uh, patients with low-grade gliomas or primary brain tumors is, a, is another excellent example in, in the uh, central nervous system. And so this is an example here of a um, non-enhancing uh, 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 left temporal uh, primary brain tumor glioma. These are typically treated with maximally safe resection and then require adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy um, and tend to have a favorable prognosis um, compared to other primary brain tumors. And thus patients who receive these, who have this diagnosis and receive these treatments 
you know, can be at risk of late effects, um, you know, longer uh, into the future. And so one of the most dreaded late effect of any radiation therapy in the brain is cognitive dysfunction. So as you can imagine, radiation around the brain is not good for memory. Um, this can affect typically short-term memory, but also things like processing speed, attention span, delayed recall. Um, and we know that this mechanism is actually caused by oxidative uh, microvascular injury uh, along the um, causing white matter demyelination and particularly injury to neural stem cells in the hippocampus, which is a part of the temporal lobes that's particularly eloquent for memory. And so when we're using radiation, particularly for someone who's going to um, have a longevity, you know, we ideally want to use as little as possible in the brain. As you can see here in this dose uh, color wash, the red being the high dose and the blue being the low dose. With proton therapy, we're able to treat a target uh, similar to the conformality or conformity of a photon plan, but with significantly less exit dose throughout the rest of the normal brain. And there has there have been uh, numerous studies now looking at trying to avoid the brain or parts of the brain uh, with radiation therapy and how that translates to improved clinical outcomes. There's level one evidence now that supports avoiding the hippocampus in the brain for patients with brain metastases does reduce the risk of long-term cognitive dysfunction. And this is probably most pronounced in our pediatric patients, so patient um, children who are still developing. Um, we know that patients treated with proton therapy uh, have a more uh, favorable intellectual outcomes. And you can see these IQ lines in the blue um, are you know, more stable compared to the declines in red using radi uh, X-ray radiation. And how this translates to the data in low-grade glioma patients, we know that photon radiation patients or patients who have received photon radiation um, have been um, reported to have progressive declines in their cognitive function in long-term survivors. This is a study out of Germany looking at patients who received X-ray radiation versus those who did not. And you can see the declines uh, in the scores um, in the green there. Um, and we know that not just treating the brain in general with radiation, but specific subsites of the brain are particularly important for this. And there, we, there have been dose-dependent uh, correlations between dose and structural atrophy and declines in function in areas of the hippocampus, the corpus callosum, and other white matter tracts. So it's not just the total dose of the brain, but particularly certain regions of the brain. And the evidence uh, for proton therapy and low-grade glioma is certainly evolving, but there is now prospective evidence uh, demonstrating uh, patients with low-grade glioma receiving proton therapy have been able to preserve or sometimes even improve their cognitive function. Um, and you can see here the, there have been um, limited declines or sometimes no declines in any of uh, these um, um, kind of uh, neurocognitive uh, quality of life domains. So it's a very exciting time for uh, patients with low-grade glioma. Uh, in fact, um, it, the evidence is now um, you know, building um, so strongly that in uh, countries like the, um, the Netherlands, they have actually already uh, designated proton therapy as the standard of care for patients with low-grade glioma in favorable uh, molecular genetics. Um, and in the US, we commonly do treat patients with proton therapy, um, but there is also an active uh, phase three randomized trial um, called BN005, which is co directly comparing randomizing patients. And this will be the, the um, you know, le level one evidence that you know, we all um, desire uh, to confirm this uh, benefit. And this trial is currently open and accruing here at Miami Cancer Institute. So switching gears from a favorable prognosis to a um, very dismal prognosis is something called leptomeningeal disease. And so this is a state of a uh, patient with cancer where the cancer has not just gone to the brain, but is actually in the, in the cerebral spinal fluid that uh, bathes the brain and the spine. And this, as you can imagine, is typically a very um, bad uh, situation with uh, you know, very poor prognosis overall. Um, you know, we don't typically think of using these advanced radiation modalities for patients with very poor prognosis, just given the um, you know, futility of treatment at times. However, uh, there's actually been some really dramatic work done using proton therapy for these patients, which I'll show you. And these are just examples of the disease along the meninges, uh, the leptomeninges here. And you can see the sugar coating enhancement along the right cerebellum. So the standard of care for patients with leptomeningeal disease has always been just palliative radiation therapy directed at the areas of, of the disease. So for example, treating the whole brain or just treating the spine regions where there is leptomeningeal disease. 
And we do not typically target the entire neuroaxis. And that's because typically that would be too toxic to treat with conventional x-ray radiation. You can see the figure on the right, where if we do try to treat the entire brain and spine, there is a lot of dose that shines through into the bowel, the heart, the lungs, the throat, the oral cavity, um, and also the bone marrow can affect your ability to keep your, your blood counts up and tolerate chemotherapy. Uh, and so cranial spineration typically has not been employed for these patients. Um, now, using proton therapy, though, we're able to treat from behind, from the patient's um, sp um, back, and treat this, the um, entire uh, cranial spinal axis, um, but not shine through anterior to all those important structures that I just mentioned. And so what this enables us to do is more safely and um, with significantly less toxicity, treat the entire cranial spinal axis. And so there actually was a um, randomized phase two trial that was recently published, was actually conducted uh, in New York at MSK in the New York Proton Center where I was previously at, and basically compared patients with leptomeningeal disease. This is mostly lung and breast cancer patients who were either treated with this experimental cranial spinal radiation using proton therapy or just focal treatments, as you can see on the right. And not only was there an improvement in control of disease in the brain and spine, but they actually ended up um, uh, demonstrating an improvement in overall survival. So these patients who typically had a very dismal prognosis actually were living almost twice as long. Uh, and there was no increase in, in uh, severe adverse events. So, you know, quite a, a major advancement uh, in the management of patients with leptomeningeal disease um, and uh, a wonderful uh, you know, utility of this, uh, this technology for patients who otherwise have limited options. So moving on from um, central nervous system tumors, we'll talk about head and neck cancers. So head and neck cancers uh, typically involve you know, multiple subsites of the, of the head and neck, including the oral pharynx, like the tonsil or the base of tongue. Um, or the larynx, thing, uh, the things of the uh, areas of those nature. And we often will use radiation therapy um, in combination with chemotherapy to definitively cure these cancers. Um, as you can imagine, radiation around the head and um, in the face can be very um, toxic, can have a lot of side effects. It's a very radiosensitive area. Um, and obviously, you know, being able to eat and get your nutrition during treatment uh, can be very challenging in these patients. And they often need to have a lot of supplementation, a lot of support, and sometimes even feeding tubes. And you can see here, um, this is the dose profile between proton therapy and x-ray radiation, and then the calculated difference in those, uh, two, um, uh, in those two plans. And you can see that what proton therapy enables you to do is treat from the posterior oblique angles and treat the cancer that's typically on the back of the throat, but spare the radiation exposure to the front of the mouth. Um, and so you know, pretty dramatic reduction overall using proton therapy compared to x-ray radiation. Um, and as you can imagine, this might uh, have uh, major gains for patients as far as their, their risk of uh, clinical toxicity. And so this is what it kind of looks like, you know, when we're able to stop the dose uh, at a certain point where um, uh, sparing uh, severe side effects such as mucositis, effect on your taste, dry mouth, all these very bothersome, sometimes severe side effects. Um, able to mitigate or minimize the risk of those um, being really uh, you know, clinically impactful. And so there have been numerous studies now looking at uh, proton therapy for head and neck cancer. I think it's one of the most auspicious disease sites. Um, this has been um, primarily looked, initially looked at in the paranasal sinus and nasal cavity area, similar to the chordoma type patients where it's a very um, uh, kind of crowded uh, real estate um, packed between a lot of uh, critical neurological structures and challenging to treat. And these studies have shown improvement in disease-free survival and local control using uh, particle therapy. But moving into the more common tumors involving the oral pharynx and the HPV-related head and neck cancers, there's now um, very robust um, multi-institutional uh, studies looking at uh, comparing modern uh, X-ray radiation, which is uh, IMRT or VMAT, with uh, modern intensity modulated proton therapy or IMPT. And this is the study on the right by Manzar is out of the Mayo Clinic um, and compared you know, over 300 patients. Um, and as you can see here, there was a dramatic reduction in clinical toxicity, both objectively with reduction in lower, uh, with lower PEG to placement rates, less uh, hospitalizations um, and decreased use of a uh, requirement of narcotic pain medicine. But then also uh, physician and patient reported outcomes were improved, including decreased pain, mucositis, changing taste, um, and improved swallow function. 
So um, this is a very exciting uh, utility of proton therapy to reduce toxicity in a what can be a very toxic treatment, but also a very curable uh, uh, patient. Um, and this was followed up by a study out of the University of Pennsylvania, um, looking at all patients um, treated there who received definitive or curative intent radiation therapy with chemotherapy. And they did a, pro a propensity score weighted analysis comparing the patients who received photon or proton therapy. And impressively, the patients who received proton therapy had an associated 70% reduction in severe adverse events. There was also a uh, significant reduction in um, hosp acute hospitalizations um, and a uh, nearly 50% reduction in performance status decline, meaning how functional or how independent patients were. And so when I think of this study, um, you know, again, when you receive chemotherapy radiation together, it can be more toxic. Oftentimes, you know, who's going to benefit the most from this? And oftentimes we have, you know, elderly patients or more frail patients who we might not think could tolerate definitive or curative therapy. And if we could uh, use a technology to limit their side effects, to get them through treatment, we're expanding uh, our reach and who we can actually treat or cure. And so this is a very exciting uh, uh, use of proton therapy, um, not just in head neck patients, but any patient who may have, uh, you know, less reserve and may not be able to tolerate a more intense therapy, you know, we can potentially treat them um, more effectively using proton therapy. And then this is a uh, randomized phase three trial um, that we participated in, um, directly comparing proton and photon therapy for patients with stage three head and neck cancer. Um, and um, this ad trial was actually um, fully accrued, and so we'll have results hopefully within a few years, and we'll certainly set the, um, you know, set the stage for um, the definitive improvement in outcomes using proton therapy. So moving on from head and neck cancers, we'll talk about uh, lung and thoracic cancers. So this is uh, another area where we have a, a you know, long way to go as far as in, um, improvements, and you know, there was actually a, a landmark study uh, called RTAG 0617, came out a few years ago, um, that tried to escalate the radiation dose from our standard 60 gray to 74 gray, hoping to improve clinical outcomes. And what was really surprising and humbling about this trial is that patients with the higher radiation dose actually did worse. They actually, as you can see on the graph, did quite worse. Um, they had not just uh, worse uh, toxicity, but also worse survival. And uh, as you can imagine, the dose of radiation around the heart and the lungs, you know, was increased with the higher dose in patients that translated into worse cardiac um, and esophageal toxicity. So we had to go back to the drawing board and think, you know, well, you know, we can't just turn up the dial. We have to be more mindful of the side effects. And so coming back to the figure we showed you before, you know, proton therapy, as you can imagine, especially if we're trying to escalate radiation dose to get a better tumor control rate, um, you know, proton therapy might be able to enable that. And so that's where the area investigation is now ongoing in lung cancer. Of note, there was a randomized trial um, out of MD Anderson that compared proton and photon therapy for stage three lung cancer and didn't see a difference in at least local failure or radiation pneumonitis, which is a side effect in the lungs from radiation. But I do want to point out that this was an older generation of proton therapy that they use. They use that passive scatter technique that I had previously described here um, and actually end up having more lung, lung exposure to radiation uh, in the proton arm compared to the photon arm in certain dose levels. And so again, the technology matters. And anytime we have to interpret a study, you know, we have to be very mindful of that. And as you can see here, um, the you know, dose to the target, um, there's that big kind of pink uh, block proximal to the target that um, we could do better with with our current technology. And so there's currently um, a randomized trial ongoing here called RTOG 1308, um, which we have open at Miami Cancer Institute and we've enrolled many patients. Um, and so, you know, this is an, um, a very important trial um, for um, patients with lung cancer. And then moving on to breast cancer. So another very common cancer for women here. Uh, and the good thing with breast cancer is that you know, we're, we're actually doing a, um, a much better job with our systemic therapies, our early detection, and breast cancer mortality is actually declining. Um, as we imp get improved uh, out clinical outcomes, we start to think about de-escalating or what we can do to, to reduce the risk of late side effects, similar to 
patients with low-grade glioma or patients with favorable head and neck cancers. And so, you know, one of the dreaded side effects of any radiation therapy for breast cancer patients is effect on their heart. And as you can imagine, the heart sits right underneath the chest wall, particularly for patients uh, with left-sided breast cancers. And there have been numerous studies now looking at the effects of radiation on the heart. Uh, and this is the landmark trial by Darby that was published in the New England Journal that correlated uh, patients receiving uh, radiation. Uh, there was a very clear dose response in dose exposure to the heart to a relative increase in risk of cardiac events over time. And this was one gray mean heart dose was associated with 7.4% uh, relative risk increase. And this has now been recapitulated in multiple studies, almost to the same decimal point. Uh, so there's certainly um, you know, a strong correlation to heart dose um, and um, risk of having, for example, surviving your, your breast cancer, but then um, you know, suffering a, a fatal heart attack. And so this is something that we um, you know, are aware of and trying to, to do better on. Uh, and this is an example of where proton therapy can come into play. So maybe not for women who have early stage breast cancer who just need the breast itself treated, but for women who have more locally advanced cancers who need to have both the breast and the regional lymph nodes um, treated, um, that can be more challenging with x-ray radiation uh, and, and, and result in a higher um, heart dose. And so using proton therapy here, uh, as you can imagine, uh, is able to shape that dose off the heart, um, particularly important uh, coronary arteries such as the um, low anterior uh, descending artery, and, um, and so reducing the overall dose exposure to the heart while still adequately treating the breast, the chest wall, and, and the regional lymphatics. And so there is growing evidence to support this advantage. So there was a phase two study out of MD Anderson, I'm sorry, out of MSK that um, looked at patients receiving proton therapy for their uh, breast cancer who were receiving regional nodal radiation. And uh, they calculated what the mean heart doses were um, for all those patients. And the mean heart dose um, was uh, around half a gray. Um, and so, you know, in comparison to our typical mean heart doses, for patients receiving photon radiation, which is runs between three and six gray. So it's about a uh, six to 12 you know, times reduction in the, in the dose uh, to the heart. And this is uh, recapitulated also for the mean uh, um, LED dose as well. Uh, and sometimes it can be even more dramatic because the LED sits right anterior underneath the chest wall. And sometimes it can see a, a hot spot, you know, um, of a very high radiation dose. And so, you know, these are the types of, uh, you know, advantages using proton therapy for patients, particularly with left-sided breast cancers, trying to reduce that risk of uh, radiation exposure to the heart. And importantly, there were no differences or no, no um, higher rates of local failure. So it was adequately treating. And then they also, in this study, interestingly, looked at echocardiograms and cardiac biomarkers for these women uh, a few months after treatment and saw no increase in any signs of cardiac distress. And, we, and they have also correlated that with patients receiving x-ray radiation, and they have seen those types of changes. So we know that uh, the dose delivered in these plans is, is um, you know, valid and that we're sparing the heart um, toxicity. And so there's currently um, now essentially fully accrued large multi-institutional randomized trial directly comparing proton and photon for these women in this category. Um, which will definitively, you know, decide um, or, or, or define the clinical benefit of avoiding the heart um, better with X-ray radiation, or with proton therapy. And then my last topic I'd like to talk about is re-radiation. So um, this is the scenario where a patient has already received a full course of radiation therapy, and then now has uh, a new area of tumor that needs to be treated, whether it's a local regional recurrence or even patients who can develop secondary primary. So for example, if a patient does smoke there and they, we cure one lung cancer, they're still at risk to develop other lung cancers, particularly if they continue to smoke. And so as patients are living longer with improved systemic therapies, we're actually running into these scenarios more commonly where a patient might be cured from their original tumor, um, but then develop a second tumor, or they live so long that eventually they do develop a local regional recurrence. And, um, and you know, we need to um, come up with treatment options for them. And historically, trying to give a second course of radiation therapy has been uh, really challenging because that can be associated with considerable risk. And the concerns for these severe toxicities outweighed the potential benefit. But now with more modern conformal radiation techniques, 
we're able, we're more suited, better suited to treat these more aggressively. You can see the different types of uh, proton plans on the right, the figure on the right. You know, we're able to more eloquently uh, treat certain areas while avoiding um, critical organs that might be, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, have seen a lot of radiation and need to be um, very mindfully avoided. Um, and so proton therapy is one of the treatment modalities that uh, best offers a distinct advantage uh, compared to conventional X-ray radiation to minimize dose overlap between courses. And in these types of scenarios, sometimes this technology can actually render an untreatable patient or, un, or at least a patient who is not um, a candidate for definitive therapy uh, treatable again. So really um, uh, a big area uh, of uh, opportunity here using proton therapy. And this is a scenario where we get a lot of patient referrals from around the region who uh, are seeking a, you know, a second chance for cure. And so again, re-radiation can be very uh, risky. Um, certainly we do this thoughtfully and humbly, um, but we do know that there can be some tissue recovery after our initial radiation exposure, but to what degree we don't always know. And so we often know that if we give a second course, even with proton therapy, we're going to exceed our normal tissue tolerances that we tend to feel comfortable treating to. And so we try to uh, apply the ALARA principle or as low as reasonably achievable. And proton therapy does this um, to the best degree. And this is an example of one of the toxicities that we're trying to avoid here. And this is a dose response curve where dose goes up, the probability of injuring the brainstem, causing necrosis in the brainstem, as you can see, exponentially goes up over about 63 gray. And this is an example of brainstem necrosis where you have that inflammation in the brainstem causing significant side effects. And so being able to reduce that risk, even in a risky scenario using protons, is a major advantage that we have here. And just to go over a couple studies here, because I, I don't want to go too long on time, um, there are now a growing litany of studies coming out looking at uh, re-irradiation using proton therapy and its potential advantages. This was a large uh, study out of uh, MSK, which I was a part of, looking at 242 patients re uh, with recurrent head and neck cancers treated with proton re-irradiation um, that we treated to full dose, so 70 gray. And the local control at one year uh, was 72% and survival was over 50%. So half of patients are able to you know, live a full year and, and nearly 70, over 70% 70 of patients have to, uh, you know, tumor controlled um, you know, uh, at that time point um, you know, where otherwise they might not have had that opportunity. And then in the CNS space uh, where there's been numerous attempts to retreat patients with recurrent brain tumors, um, the historic X-ray radiation trials have not shown improvement in any, uh, any uh, in overall survival for these patients with recurrent gliomas. And so now we're trying to be more aggressive and proton therapy is an opportunity to, to, to try to find that um, window in the, in the therapeutic index. And so one of the trials we're opening here at MCI is using proton therapy, but using a pulse reduced dose rate uh, of proton therapy to try and even more safely dose escalate. Um, and so what this is, is essentially we're delivering the proton therapy even slower uh, each day and allowing the normal tissues to try to heal in between each, uh, each beam. And um, you can see here is a patient treated um, just this year uh, with PRDR proton therapy up to full dose retreatment and uh, on their first follow-up scan had had a dramatic response. And so we're very excited about this and we have a, a formal trial opening here at MCI very soon for patients with recurrent glioma. A few other disease sites here just to touch on a study, multi-institutional study looking at proton reiteration for women with recurrent or new primary breast cancers. Um, the cumulative doses are very high in the, in the tri uh, triple digits. Um, and as you can see, the uh, disease control rate were excellent with nearly 100% um, uh, disease, uh, distant metastasis, free survival, and overall survival, and very low grade two toxicity. So women with breast cancer needing retreatments do uh, very well. Um, and then looking at uh, patients with GI cancers, I, had, I actually didn't discuss GI cancers, um, gastrointestinal cancers, but there's also been some tremendous work uh, done looking at proton therapy, both in the upfront setting. And then here's a study looking at uh, recurrent uh, GI malignancies um, in a small study, but very high cumulative doses uh, and a very um, you know, high one-year local control rate with uh, you know, very reasonable high-grade toxicities. 
And then lastly, looking at lung cancer. So this is another uh, area where patients can have a lot of local regional recurrences. And so we're seeing a lot of patients who might need retreatments. And there are now growing data uh, looking at uh, proton re-irradiation for recurrent balanced muscle lung cancer. Uh, this was a study out of Penn looking at 45 patients uh, and uh, demonstrated a uh, very nice um, you know, one-year uh, survival rate of uh, nearly 60%. So nearly two-thirds of patients are able to survive a year despite their cancer coming back in the lung. And importantly, they associated the dose to the esophagus, um, which is obviously very critical in maintaining nutrition and also a very radiosensitive organ uh, with worsening overall survival. So if we're able to reduce the dose to the esophagus using proton therapy, this may translate into even more meaningful clinical outcomes. So in conclusion, uh, you know, proton therapy is a very exciting uh, advanced radiation modality. It has some distinct dosimetric advantages uh, for patients, uh, particularly in certain select clinical scenarios. There's certainly still more data to, to be developed, but it, it is uh, the literature is rapidly growing. As you can see, there's numerous studies now coming out, um, both uh, retrospective, prospective, and randomized trials, some of which have been reported, some of which are now fully accrued or almost fully accrued. And so we're going to have even more data in the next several years. And you know, we're very excited for this um, you know, opportunity for particular patients, particularly younger patients who have better prognosis, and we're really worried about those late effects, but also the older patients who might be more frail uh, and uh, you know, would want to minimize their acute toxicities and facilitate definitive therapy. And then uh, patients we often commonly see receiving proton therapy are ones who have had prior radiation, and we're trying to minimize that dose overlap and offer them a second chance for a cure. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Dr. Press, what a phenomenal presentation. I love how you took one of the most complex <laughs> uh, treatments uh, now known in radio-oncology and placed it in such a succinct and incredibly easy to understand manner, uh, yet uh, not forgetting how complex this whole process is. Um, several things that come to mind as uh, we wait for some questions. Um, 42 operational centers in the United States. We are so fortunate to have one of the most sophisticated ones uh, in the United States here, uh, one of the pencil beans here in, uh, in Miami Cancer Institute. I know that uh, at this point we have over 100 around the globe uh, that are functional and yet not all have uh, the same technology. Some, as you mentioned, the scatter beam, which are still good, I'm assuming, but uh, not as efficacious as the proton itself. Um, uh, other pearls that I take uh, from your conference is the fact that you did mention that dose matters. It is perhaps uh, one of the uh, best ways of actually uh, placing proton in a completely different environment in comparison to the other great technologies that uh, um, and techniques or modalities rather that we have at MCI, the arsenal of uh, or, or the the amount of of uh, technology that you have available in your armamentarium is phenomenal, and obviously uh, being able to select the most appropriate one that will give you the ultimate and most efficacious uh, result is the one that you're going to use. However, uh, keeping only that particular sentence in mind gives us all a great peace of mind. Since the dose is the one that uh, worries you as a radio oncologist, uh, and, and we all know that uh, the higher the dose, obviously you're hoping that the survival will be uh, improved, especially in that very delicate five years of, of the patient's life. So that, that is uh, absolutely remarkable. Uh, one of the things that we always think in medicine, obviously, uh, uh, when we confine a radio-oncologist or a hemato-oncologist, obviously, what is the treatment that that patient is going to be receiving? And uh, one of the biggest concerns is the side effects. You, you touched upon many of the components of uh, potential side effects, but uh, in the back of my mind is always one that, uh, that lingers, and it has to be the radi radiation-induced uh, lymphopenia, for instance, that could be debilitating for so many patients. Uh, and that is also uh, perhaps, and forgive my ignorance, but it, it could be also dose-related. How is that mitigated with proton? In your experience, well, what has been the result? 
Yeah, absolutely. Those are great comments, and I appreciate that. I did want to also just quickly mention, you know, in addition to the technologies you have at MCI, it's always a team effort, and that's really the, the gem of the department here is the wonderful uh, team that we have, including the physicists, the decimetrists behind the scenes, in addition to the physicians, the nurses, you know, um, every, everyone here is really working together to, to do the best for the patient uh, in addition to the technologies. So just want to mention that. And then, you know, that's a great point too, regarding toxicities. You know, I didn't, I didn't talk about all the toxicities that we're trying to mitigate with proton therapy. Lymphopenia or effect on blood counts is certainly a big one. You know, anytime we treat with radiation therapy, we can cause declines in blood counts counts. Um, and this is particularly important because patients uh, don't just need radiation. They also need chemotherapies or other systemic medicines. And if they have blood counts are too low, then uh, they might, we might be battling each other as far as trying to, to adequately treat the patient, you know, not disabling the ability to get systemic therapy. And so by exposing the entire body or the, what we call the blood pool, uh, you know, the, the total blood volume of the patient to radiation, we, we have seen in phase three randomized trials, improvements in the lymphopenia rate. Uh, and so we know that lymphopenia, the immune system, all these things are critical for, um, you know, uh, patient outcomes. Uh, and so there's a lot of research going into just how to harness that improvement and how, how much of a difference that makes. So uh, improving or keep maintaining blood counts uh, with our radiation treatment is going to be a big part of proton therapy going forward. Indeed. And, uh, and also, I want to make sure that uh, I repeat what you just reminded us, is that uh, we do have several clinical trials in place, uh, especially for glioma. We do receive a great deal of requests uh, that come to your team and obviously to our neuro-oncologists uh, that collaborate with you. Uh, and uh, several comes to mind similar to the ones you mentioned, the N005 uh, clinical trial. And uh, we want to make sure that our physician or our partners abroad uh, understand that uh, there is a way of actually uh, getting those patients that perhaps are at the later stages, especially babies or kids, that can benefit from uh, these type of treatments. So please forward them to Dr. Uh, uh, Press and the team. So um, with that, uh, the other thing that uh, I think that it is important to mention, especially because it is a technology, as you mentioned initially, it is a treatment modality that, as you mentioned initially, it's not necessarily new, but it has advanced as uh, we advance in technology and as, we, as you advance in your research uh, in making sure that uh, the, the machine is working towards the advantage of the patient. Uh, one of the things that uh, it is worth mentioning is that it does work in almost every part of the body, you know, from the uh, skull all the way to the lower uh, abdomen. And, and, um, and, and that is extremely, extremely important. I get a lot of requests from abroad asking me, would proton be the solution? But you did mention something extremely important you rely on an interdisciplinary team approach to actually uh, seeking the right modality for the right patient for the right tumor at the right time. So um, let's go ahead and read uh, those three questions that we have for you. One is from Dr. Williams, Timothy Williams. It says, is proton therapy appropriate for use for secondary metastatic diseases of the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for the for the question, uh, Mr. Williams. And so, you know, as I mentioned previously, you know, we typically don't uh, employ proton therapy for patients with metastatic disease or have you know poor prognosis, which you know patients with secondary cancers to the brain you know often do. Obviously, the one big caveat is patients with leptomeningeal disease, who you know that's essentially an extension of secondary malignancy to the brain, you know, now involving the, the cerebral spinal fluid. You know, there are series looking at proton therapy for, um, for metastatic disease uh, uh, in select instances. The times I have used it for patients with uh, metastatic disease are often when they have recurrence, you know, after initial treatment. So, for example, a patient with a, a lesion, you know, in close proximity to the optic chiasm, which is critical for vision, uh, had radiosurgery, initial response, and then had a local recurrence. And so in situations like that, using this advanced technology to try to reduce that dose exposure to the you know, optic apparatus, again, might be a benefit compared to a, uh, a, a, a different uh, you know, treatment modality. But in general, for patients with, for example, brain metastases as their only or their primary you know, need for radiation, uh, there are other modalities, again, in our arsenal that would be better suited for those, for those patients. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, Dr. Uh, Press, are we referring all left uh, breast uh, for proton uh, treatment, or are we still looking into actually using the traditional modalities as we knew it before? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there, there, I would say, you know, most patients with left breast can side of breast cancers who need regional notoration, you know, are now considered for it. Um, and, um, you know, oftentimes it depends on their patient's anatomy. So everyone's, you know, uh, chest wall can be different. And sometimes patients can have a really nice separation of their heart from the chest wall using other types of techniques. Sometimes we ask patients to take big breaths in during the treatment to separate the heart from the from the chest wall, for example. And that enables us to adequately treat those patients or safely treat those patients with conventional X-ray radiation. But, um, but uh, I would say, the, you know, majority of patients with left side of breast cancer is receiving regional radiation are considered now for proton therapy. And oftentimes there are other factors involved with that, but it is certainly um, uh, becoming increasingly common. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that the last statistics on proton, I know you obviously will be help, uh, helpful in correcting me, but uh, uh, we have treated so far in the past uh, years about 177, if not 200,000 patients with proton. Uh, is that, does that sound uh, about um, right? I mean, it, it is an incredible number. Yeah, well, the, the numbers are certainly increasing. Obviously, as the number of centers that are proliferating, you know, really access to a proton therapy center has been the major limiting factor, you know, historically. Um, for example, there used to only be a center in Boston and, um, you know, um, and then if you had if you had to go there to get the treatment, so it just wasn't available to the vast majority of patients. And now that there's you know center here in, in Miami and you know centers throughout the the country, more patients are are getting access to this treatment. And um, and so that that it certainly is uh, increasing in its utilization. Uh, overall, the number of patients receiving radiation therapy in general who get proton therapy is still relatively small. It's typically around five or 10, around 5%. So it's still very small, but that number is certainly going to increase, particularly as the evidence uh, improves and the number of centers opening, opening is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, more, is just more readily available to most patients. Yep. I, I, I think I owe it to our audience to actually shed some light in regards to cost. And uh, it has always been, traditionally speaking, it has always been the uh, the fact that uh, proton therapy is extremely expensive and uh, obviously not available to everyone and insurance companies do not cover it. Well, that has changed dramatically, especially with uh, uh, Miami Cancer Institute's philosophy. What we have done at Baptist Health and especially Miami Cancer is precisely price the uh, proton therapy exactly as if it was a traditional or regular modality that a patient will get in his own country or anywhere in the United States. So I want to make sure I disclose that up front uh, to make certain that everybody understands that not because we have a proton beam, three grand trees of, of proton available, we're going to be using the proton. We will use the right technology as appropriate for that particular patient, but more importantly, the cost is exactly the same. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind, please. Um, we have a question from uh, um, uh, a, a beautiful uh, patient here, and she says, good afternoon, doctor. I am an international patient. If a patient has a colonoscopy six years ago, there was a small polyp, should there be a repeat colonoscopy? A patient is now in mid forties. So this is a basic medical question, and I think it's uh, lovely that Mrs. Campbell asked her. Yeah, no, I'm ha happy to try to address that, even though you know I'm not a GI oncologist, <laughs> but you know, I for, so most likely yes. And I would I would say that uh, the real question, the first question I'd have is why did the patient get the colonoscopy in the first place? Particularly if they were you know late 30s, that's actually typically early for uh, colon colon cancer screening. However, that the age recommended age to start screening actually has been uh, reduced to 45. Um, so if the patient was having symptoms, you know, have had, had polyps, particularly if they have a family history, then they probably do need a more timely um, follow-up colonoscopy, which generally if, if the colonoscopy was normal, they would recommend another 10 years. So the fact that you're six years out, you're now in your mid-40s, which is close to the recommended age, and you had an indication to get a colonoscopy originally in your 30s, you know, I would, I would say it's probably uh, about time, and I would certainly go back and, you know, speak with your doctor about that. Thank you so very much, Dr. Press. Um, you know what? It's uh, five o'clock. Uh, time flies when we're having fun, but we want to be considerate to you. We know that you have uh, still some hours uh, to put at the clinic, uh, but I wanted to thank you on behalf of the entire international team. Our international team is here to assist you, obviously, Dr. Press, uh, with all your international patients. But more importantly, I want to thank all the participants today uh, for uh, sparing some time and listening to Dr. Press.
Um, thank you so very much. If you do have any questions or you have any doubts or, or concerns, please email them to bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. Uh, that is BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We'll make sure to send them to Dr. Press for his uh, response and uh, liaise with you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next oncology lecture series. This one is scheduled for Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. Once again, thank you so very much. Stay away from the sun. Have a wonderful summer and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Press, for your time. Thank you so much.